Hello. Yes, it's me, Georgia May Mossholder. Back with David Jeremiah's book, Captured by Grace. And this is the third reading, but only chapter two. Chapter two. The compassionate plan of grace that saved a wretch like me. When was the last time you met a wretch strolling down the avenue? <coughs> How about a transgressor? A miscreant? A worker of iniquity? Look those words up in a dusty old dictionary and you'll find an entire arsenal of powerful words for sin and its perpetrators. Yet many of these words are on the endangered vocabulary, vocabulary list today. They grow musty and unfamiliar from lack of use. The question is, in a world such as ours, why would so many colorful and descriptive terms for wickedness go out of style? Sin, sin is still in. Only the names have changed. Debauchers have been replaced by compulsive personality types. We don't hear much about iniquity, but we do make plenty of references to unproductive personal habits. Nobody this side of the Grimm's brothers is actually wicked today. Just a lot of folks with behavioral disorders, right? If anyone in our society does something socially unacceptable, well, just blame the chemistry and find the right prescription drug. If we can't eliminate sin in practice, we'll change its name and talk around it until nobody recognizes the problem. A few years ago, the Wall Street Journal placed an advertisement in the New York Times observing that our generation has dismantled its old, sturdy frames of reference for personal behavior. The idea of guilt was swept away, leaving people to make their own judgment on calls on moral issues. The ad concluded that many wrecked people could have used a road map. Jettisoning the guilt trip sounds like a lot of fun first a real party. Only later, when it's too late, do we wander through the moral debris and wonder if our freedom was truly free. That's when the old terminology seems so much more descriptive. Words such as wickedness and wretch throw in remorse and penitence. We find the word wretch, of course, in amazing grace. Let me ask you, how do you feel when you sing that phrase, a wretch like me? Some of us belt out that line with a huge smile as if we had no clue what we were proclaiming about ourselves. Others pay more attention and they don't like that phrase one bit. Who in this songbook calling a wretch? Who is this songbook calling a wretch? There have been many attempts to remove the W word from the standard hymnal. Wretch. The term is often confused with wretch, R-E-T-C-H, which is not even its distant cousin. At the risk of indelicacy, we'll simply point out that the one without the W descends from a Middle English term meaning to clear one's throat. Wretch, W-R-E-T-C-H, on the other hand, descends from a more ancient lineage. It comes from an old English term meaning someone who is miserable, an exile. Well, that's illuminating for what are exiles, but what the Wall Street Journal called wrecked people who need a road map. A wretch is one miserable human being in a self-imposed exile. 
like the prodigal son, like John Newton. As a matter of fact, your dictionary should carry a headshot of John Newton with its listing for wretch. Let's get back to his story. A wretched exile. To understand the wonder of grace through the eyes of Newton, you must have some idea of the wretchedness of his exile. We rejoin Newton as a young man on the deck of one of his first sailing vessels. He is depressed, but Prozac won't be invented for centuries. He is raging, but there are no handy anger management books around. Therefore, he sits beneath the moon, stares into the restless sea, and weighs two options. A. Maybe he will commit suicide. B. Maybe he will murder the captain. Perhaps, by the restrain restraining hand of God, he chooses C. None of the above. Newton wrote a letter in 1754 saying that before he had reached the age of 20, he was never an hour in anyone's company without attempting to corrupt their character. He once said of himself, My daily life was a course of the most terrible blasphemy and profaneness. I don't believe that I ever have ever since met so daring a blasphemer as myself, not content with common profanities and cursing. I daily invented new ones. His soul was deep in exile, farther away than any ship could have carried him. In his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, A Brevery of Sin, the, the theologian Cornelius Plantinga, Jr., assures us that we can never arrive at any definition of grace without sin as our point of departure. Cheap grace, he says, trivializes the cross of God, Christ. How can we avert our eyes from a cross that is drenched in holy blood? It was for sin that God, clothed in flesh, writhed in agony on our behalf. It was for iniquity for wickedness, for every manner of wretched, despicable evil that he submitted to beating and humiliation and finally the obscenity of death itself. Grace can only shine in its ultimate brilliance because it emerges from ultimate darkness. Therefore, Plantinga points out, we load up on bland and inoffensive modern worship practices, seeker-sensitive, though they may be at our own peril. Catchy, catchy phrases, choruses, and positive thinking sermons are crowd-pleasers, but sometimes the praise, ban the praise brands drown out the sobering reality of sin, not unproductive habits but sin and the consequent demand for confession, repentance, and forgiveness. Well, this is not to weigh in on all of the issues that surround our modern worship, but to question any gathering of the saints where sin is swept under the sanctuary carpet. This, that could happen against the background of a pipe organ or an electric guitar. The point is that we must confront the true enemy in clear terms. Paul was the apostle of grace, but he never denied the apostasy of sin. In fact, it was his very honesty on the subject that caught John Newton's despairing eye. The exile was intrigued that a man like Paul could call himself the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 That God would pluck his champion from the roster of the enemy. Newton read Paul's word in 1 Timothy 1, 
13 to 14, over and over. I was formerly a blasphemer, a prosecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Abundant grace for abundant sin. John Newton couldn't stop thinking about the implications of such an idea. Prelude to Grace Paul was not one to airbrush the scandal of his own past. His resume, as it crops up in his writings, always includes the hard, hard truth that he was the least of the apostles. In his words, because he had the blood of the martyrs on his hand. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He was, quote, less than the least of all the saints. Ephesians 3, 8. He was the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1, 15. But the truth of it, as Paul shows in Romans 3, is that none of us has clean hands. The apostle goes to the Old Testament to make his case. Ecclesiastics, five psalms, one citation from Isaiah. Five times he uses the words none or all, for none are righteous. All are ruined and helpless in the sight of God. We are a world of exiles, as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an empty tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. <sighs> That's Romans three ten to 18. The chorus to Paul's sorrowful song is no one, not even one. He comes around to that refrain five times, lest we cling to any shred of self-righteousness. Paul tells us again and again. Well, this is a message no one wants to hear, for the upshot of it is that you can be the most upright citizen of your town and and still, before the revealing light of heaven, you are a miserable wretch at the mercy of a holy God. You can have a crime-free record, perfect standing with the IRS, the works of Mother Teresa, the passion of Paul, and, and the conviction of Gandhi. And you can still stand accused and convicted before the perfect standards of an infinitely righteous judge. Here are more words we'd rather not sing about ourselves. Total depravity. We would prefer to reserve such a term for child abusers, pornographers, and terrorists. But Paul shakes his head sadly and says, none of us is righteous. No, not one. Our depravity doesn't come in half doses. Total means just that. Charles Swindoll has written that if depravity were blue, we'd be blue all over. We'd bleed blue. Think blue thoughts and have no possibility of a single fragment of a second when our heart, soul, and mind weren't flooded in blue. You could be as colorful a personality as you wish, 
but every tint of the rainbow would be overwhelmed by blue. Ivan Turgenev, the 19th century Russian novelist and playwright, said, quote, I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. End quote. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn writes, quote, If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? End quote. Sin cuts its merciless swath through the entire human race, not missing a single heart. On the other hand, there is some good news, very significant good news. Total depravity meets its match in total grace. One infinite value cancels out another. In the end, we must acknowledge the darkness within us and the light that comes only from God. Both are unrelenting and both define every moment of our life. Every atom in our bodies is infected by the disease of sin, but every atom may likely be covered by the grace of God. The vilest offender can reap the deepest joy of heaven, joys of heaven. The only requirement comes in two supreme realizations. First, that we are totally contaminated. Second, that we are totally forgiven only through the love and grace and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has shown us the first of those realities. Now with great joy, he turns his attention to the second. Principles of grace. Get ready, for we will look now at five of the most important verses in the Bible. This section of Romans may be possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, attributed his conversion to these verses. Bible scholar Donald Gray Barnhouse drew a great heart across them in his Bible. He declared that they constitute the heart of Romans, the heart of the New Testament, the heart of the Word of God itself. Imagine the whole galaxy of revelation from our Father revolving around this single point, the ground zero of our spiritual universe. Now, as we stand upon this holy ground, Paul shows us seven components of the grace of God. Talk about your vocabulary. These words will never grow musty in the dictionary of heaven. They are words such as grace, faith, justification, redemption, freely, the antidote for wretch, iniquity, depravity, and the rest. Learn these verses, know the meanings of these words, and you have passed a master's course in salvation science. Paul wrote this textbook of grace through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John Newton escaped his exile here. John Bunyan made his pilgrimage in this passage. This little sight in your Bible is the missing link between life and death, flesh and spirit, creature and creator. 
and every one of us must pass this spring and drink deeply. If we are to understand who we are and how we may be rescued from ourselves. Grace apart from works. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. That was Romans 3.21. Right now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. In the entire world, only two religions may be found. The first of them might be called the religion of divine accomplishment. The second is the religion of human achievement. Paul sets these two conflicting ideas against one another. The apostle knows from first-hand experience that human achievement is designed for failure. He has lived it both ways and found human achievement to be a dead end. He once surpassed every standard of excellence established for a Hebrew Pharisee, and it all came to nothing. And he will tell us over and over in each of his epistles that works can never survive, suffice. We might as well try building a ladder to heaven. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. Verse 5. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. 2 Timothy 1.9 not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 verse 5 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Galatians 2, verse 16 and 21. Grace accepted by faith. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 22. Now we turn to the idea of faith. Listen to the frequency with which it comes through Paul's spin in Romans 3. God set forth as appropriation by his blood through faith. Verse 25. The justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Verse 26. A man is justified by faith. Verse 28, justify the circumcised by faith. Verse 30, and the uncircumcised by faith. Verse 30, do we then make void the law through faith? Verse 31, a note as noted British pastor Charles Spurgeon once said, Faith is believing Christ is who he said he was and that he'll do what he promised to do and then living accordingly. That way our faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. God's grace 
meets human faith, and peace is declared in the war between heaven and earth. Uh, grace, available to all who believe, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That was from Romans three twenty two and 23. Keyword, all. That is one immense three-letter word, for it measures the width of God's grace and the height of his love. God's net is as large as the number of people who are willing to fall into its safety. No one is outside the, the scope of his grace. There are no distinctions within the notion the nation of the sinful, no pecking order within the league of the elect. There are indeed degrees of sin. A jaywalker receives a lighter sentence than a murderer, but all of that is earthly reckoning, nitpicking by the standard of heaven. Because a millionth of a molecule, molecule of sin contaminates a soul, all are found guilty. And because grace cleanses us from sin just as absolutely, we find ourselves standing at the throne of grace without any human ranks of measurements. All are equally pure and clean before God. You and the Apostle Paul will stand together, equally righteous in God's sight, the God, the Father, will look upon each of you and see only the purity of his own Son. One more. Grace attained by justification. Being justified. Romans 3, 24. At the center point of this centerpiece passage, we find the concept of justification. Well, don't be fooled. The idea is more complex than you may suppose. I may forgive you for doing me some wrong, but I haven't justified you. The judge may throw your case out of court, but it doesn't affect your true guilt or innocence. Pardon simply takes away the punishment for a sin. Justification erases any record of your transgression. Jesus infuriated the religious leaders by this very act. He forgave sins of which he was not even the victim. How could he, as a third party, forgive one person's transgressions against another? Well, he can do so because he is God, because he is pure, and because he chooses to be a third party to every wrong act we can ever commit. Christ removes not only the penalty for our sin, he cleanses us completely from its slightest taint. Hugh and I stand before God as if we have lived a life of utter purity and perfection. Forgiveness says, I'm going to let you slide this time. Justification says, I'm going to remove the offense from all memory, as if it never occurred. It forgives and forgets. The president can pardon, but he cannot reinstate the criminal to the position of one who has not broken the law. God does both. That's the key to justification. John Stott writes that, quote, Justification is not a synonym for amnesty, but an act of justice, of gracious justice. When God justifies sinners, he's not de declaring bad people to be good or saying that they are not sinners after all. He is pronouncing them legally righteous, free from any liability to the broken law, because he himself, in his Son, 
has borne the penalty of their law-breaking. I think that's it. When I come back, grace awarded freely. That's good. Uh, all right. I will be back with the next reading very soon. Okay? I promise. Let me know if you like this. Oh, Larry reminded me that Ray used to always ask people to subscribe if they haven't already subscribed and to share this website of ours, Reach More Now, with their friends. If you know them and if you think they would like our stuff, I hope you'll do that too. Thank you. So, Larry, I did it. Bye-bye. Uh,